Well, Jaws all happy. His buddy Amy is here. And the last time that I saw Amy, I noticed that her Elvis glasses were, some of the paint was chipping away a little bit. So I went ahead and ordered her some from Graceland with yeah. the actual EP Ooh. and the TCB and everything on oh, there. So you. you look great. Thanks. What's up my friends? So yeah, Amy and I are doing a vlog together today, but it's not just us. We have quite a few people in the vlog today. Vicki Hamilton suggested someone that she thought we would have fun interviewing and um, and he's also going to do something for us. So this is probably going to be two vlogs that you guys will enjoy. We're going to meet her over in Griffith Park and um, well, we're going to meet a man named Matthew Roberts. And uh, when you meet him, I think you'll understand why we wanted to talk to him. So Days with Jordan the Lion, Amy, Vicky, Matthew, and Jaw begins now. So this is where we've decided to do our little interview today with Mr. Matthew Roberts. All right, so Mr. Matthew Roberts, Vicki Hamilton, great friend of the show, said that I should talk to you. Now, I honestly, I have heard of you before. I know you as a guy who potentially, um, from what I've heard, is related to Charles Manson. Do you want to talk about how that came to be or how you, or why you think that that's the case or what the deal is with that? Yeah, well, I mean, it was a long, long process, but I am um, about 93, 95, I was engaged to be married and um, my fiance wanted to know what nationality our kids would be if we had kids. We never did, but and uh, because I was adopted and I never knew my nationality and I really didn't care. I thought, well, this is great. I can't possibly be racist because I don't know what I am. And um, I didn't really have any desire to look up my biological parents. I figured if they didn't want me for whatever reason, that was just fine. But um, in order that, you know, we might have a little bit of an understanding of our, my progenity or, you know, I heritage right. or genetic history, I went along with it. At first it was, I, I was put off by the whole thing. They were like $350 to do the search, then it's $60 an hour after that search time. And I felt kind of like, you know, you just get in the computer and look her name up, I'll call her myself, you know, how hard can it be? So I was kind of, you know, rick -a -frack -a -frack -a -frack for a few years and then it, I've realized, okay, I, if I don't do this, I'm never going to, you know, get anywhere. So I ponied up the, first I did non-identifying information for 50 bucks, and none of that was true. And then I ponied up the money, and, and they got a hold of my mother right away, my birth mother. And the adoption lady, her name was Mary Wake, she was the same woman who adopted me in 1968. Still worked for the uh, Lutheran Social Services. Um, I don't know about today, but at that time in, in 99 or whatever. And um, she, I talked to her and she told me she spoke with my mother and she kind of warned me like a little bit. Your mother's a little bit, you know, I don't exactly know what word she is, but basically let me know she had some mental issues and problems. Okay. And I got, um, the way it works is they contact your parents and they say your child wants to speak to you would you like to be in contact with them and if the parents say yes then they they exchange letters if they say no then that's it yeah you're out of luck because you know all the rights are with the parents and none with the kids which i think should be the opposite way around but fortunately my mother agreed to um correspond with me and we exchanged letters and um at first it seemed she seemed pretty normal she was talking about rhubarb and her cats and um water and trees or whatever and i thought well she's just a you know, hip, hippie or something, you know? Right. And, um, but it wasn't long before I came to realize that there, were, you know, there was something wrong, you know, something with, you know, her stories were just really far, far out there. Did you not believe them or were they just... Well, at first, I didn't, to be honest with you. I mean, I didn't know what to think. Like, she told me, okay, she, one thing she said, she just wrote in a letter that she named me Lawrence Alexander and she put a line with a question mark and said... I can't tell you your last name. I can tell you in person one day for security reasons, she says. Okay. I was like, okay. And then she said that she was involved in a infamous hippie group and that she was raped, gang raped, and, you know, dosed with LSD or something. There were drugs involved or Kool-Aid. What year was, this would have been? You were this born? This would have been 67, 68. Okay. And, um... 
And you know, and then she said the group of hippies were the Manson group, and this is where I was just going, okay, come on. Now. Another, you know, yeah, you're yeah. like another person you claiming know. to be part of it. And yeah. then she's claiming that the government did all these things to her. They were changing her new tires on her car and replacing them with old tires on her car. And I was like, well, she's just schizophrenic, you know? Yeah. And, but, you know, her, her names and dates and numbers added up. Right. Quite, Were, quite had you studied any of that story? Were you, a, I mean, a Manson? I, I wasn't. Okay, a historian. I wasn't or... a fan or a follower. And I just, but the irony here is my very first book report as a child, uh, I think I was, in, I don't know what grade, very young, uh, was Helter Skelter. And it was just by virtue of the book being on a table somewhere. And all I did was look at the pictures and um, kind of surmised the book report from there and, and got a B, I think, on it. Because I never read, actually, believe it or not, I didn't read my first book from start to finish till I was 25 years old. I read, I wrote my first book when I was 23. And it's not that I couldn't read, I actually could read quite well, but I had an attention deficit disorder. And, um, you know, eventually I came to realize if I put the radio or the TV on, it would quiet my thoughts enough to where I could retain what I was reading. Because I would read a page of, you know, be thinking about hot air balloons or whatever. and and. Um, and, um, what, were, what was your thought of Charles Manson from read, from doing the Helter Skelter book report? Did you have an opinion of him? Well, I did. And the, the other irony here is that when I graduated high school, I uh, moved to Los Angeles. I was 17, I think. I'd only been graduated out of high school about a month or two. And I got accepted at MI, Musicians Institute of Technology. So, I went there as well. Oh, yeah? What year? Uh, 2000. For which instrument? Um, guitar. Oh, awesome. Well, I went there for drums, and there was only... GIT, PIT, and BIT at the time, and they were on Hollywood Boulevard. I actually helped build the, the building from Max Factor to what it is on McFadden and moved them. And um, so there was an individual going to school there at that time who had gotten out of prison after turning state's evidence against Charlie and only did 17 years after he admitted the- He was going to MI? Uh, Steve Brogan went to MI. No kidding. Clem, and he, he here's a guy who admi yeah, admittedly chopped a person's head off with a pocket knife to see what it would feel like, who does 17 years, and somebody who actually didn't kill anyone who's doing life, or, you know. So anyway, I had the opportunity to talk to this guy on many occasions. It was funny because there was a bookstore across the street called Dalton, and, and you would go over there, and the Helter Skelter book would open up to that page. It was all, you know, traffic on it with his picture. And he, everyone liked him. He was a good blues player and that the owner of the school at the time his name was Pat Hicks actually had him working on his house and gave him keys to his house no kidding until he found out who he was right and he invited me and my roommates to go fishing with him and we were like well maybe not but when I talked to him we, you know we said well, what are you doing hanging out with this guy he was crazy you know and he's told us he said well we thought he was Jesus Christ we watched him raise a bird from the dead and we all kind of said yeah that must have been good asset back then and you know they made a bus fly away or something all this crazy stuff and and i was just like okay whatever and you know still had no reason to make any kind of connection or suspect anything but but um it, but it didn't end there even um i had a girlfriend who dated whose mother dated roman polanski really yes and um said they were what, doing, about what time would you say when um well, I don't know. I guess her family had built a cult called Morehouse in San Francisco and, and were, were instrumental in building that cult. So I guess it was around that time. Okay. Because I guess he was um, somewhat a um, connoisseur of, of, you know, the black, uh, dark um, religions and stuff. Church of Satan and, and um, Process Church and, and, and this Morehouse or whatever. So I think it had something to do with that, or that around that time whenever that was, it could probably be researched. Um, and I guess they were doing LSD every day of the week, like all the time, every day. Your girlfriend's mom and, mom and, and Rowan? Roman Polanski. Okay. And, um, and there were just, I worked with a girl who's, um, whose family was really good friends with Kurt Gentry. I spoke with him on the phone who wrote the book with, with uh, you know, with um, Bugliosi and yeah. all these weird kind of coincidences or synchronicities or connections that I, I kind of later pieced together. Um, but anyway, uh, you know... Did your mother tell you when you met her, 
And did she give you any hint as to Charles Manson possibly being your father at that time, or did you have to figure it out? Or well, well first of all, because you said I, she couldn't say the last name. Yeah, first of all, I never met her. I uh, and I'll tell you about that the reason for that. Um, but I corresponded with her in email and, and letters and on the phone. And um, just when she said, "I'll tell you your last name in person for security reasons," then she said she was involved in a hippie group and a. In the Manson group, and then I, in, in an orgy, I was conceived in this LSD orgy. And I said, "Well, was Charlie in in that LSD orgy?" And she said, um, "Yes." And then I'm like, I look in the mirror, and I'm like, "Oh my God, man!" I look. Yeah, dude, nice you look twin. a lot. For, if you don't mind me, like just kind of giving people a view, <laughs> you really do look a lot I, like you know, the guy. When he was okay, I was when I was born, he was 33 years old. And when I was 33 years old, I mean, I looked like, there's times where I, I'm not sure what, who I'm looking at in the pictures, you know? And, and so then I did the math and I was like, okay, he got out of prison March 21st, 1967. I was born March 22nd, 1968. Then he went to jail in what, January of 70. He's never been out since. So there's only a small window of opportunity, you know, three months or so where my conception could have occurred and the timeline fit perfectly. Yeah. So then I was just going, oh man, this, I mean, what kind of a nightmare am I getting sucked into here? Two crazy people are, are like sucking me into some bizarre, you know. But to be stuff. honest, this is the kind of stuff you want to know. This is why you're oh, looking yeah. into who your history is because you might want to know this is possibly going to enter your life at some point. Absolutely. And, and so, you know, meanwhile, lots of time kind of passes, you know, because you just try to reel it in. But then... <laughs> Then, you know, I lived up by the Hollywood Bowl for years. I, I had, um, there was an apartment complex that I lived in like four times, and then I lived up on the hill, and um, there was 107 steps I had to walk up to. It was, um, well, it was on Milner and then La Las Palmas. And the apartment building went from Highland to Las Palmas all the way across, and then there were these steps that went right up there, and I lived right up top there. And so I used to park my, I had a Ford Explorer that I bought in 2000. And, one, I think it was brand new, and parked it in the um, Hollywood Bowl parking lot. And I come out one day, and my actually, ironically enough, Vicky had hooked me up with Al Jorgensen. I was supposed to take him out to some strip clubs, and I walked out there. To, my car was gone; it wasn't in the parking lot anymore. So I borrowed a friend's car and went out and took. Like as in, it was stolen. It was stolen, and. And they found it two weeks later on the day of my birthday at Barstow. This person had stolen it, was on their way to Vegas and ran out of gas. And it cost me like 935 bucks to get my own tr truck back. So I went out to Barstow and I got it. And I'm driving back and there's all this stuff in there, crack pipes and like, you know, like it's a transvestite hooker or something. All these weird pictures and stuff that had sold the vehicle. And I flip over a purse and and there's a signed autograph picture of Charles Manson on my passenger seat. Really? Yeah. And I still have to this day. And when I looked at this picture, there was something about the picture. It was a side profile and particularly the nose because we both have flared nostrils, which isn't a typical Caucasian trait. Right. And as it turned out, his father, or the person I think might be his father, Colonel Scott, was part black. And that's, I think, where we get the nostrils. And I'm like, okay... You know, and then, you know, I have, like, hairy arms, like he had, you know, and, and chest hair, and just kind of were like hairy people, I guess. I, Did you I ever happen to write him and send him a picture yourself to see what his response was? I did, and I had already written him by this point. Okay. And, uh, okay, so I wrote him, asking him if he remembered my mother, and um, Cook County, which was where I was born in Illinois, in Chicago, and he said he did, and he remembered... Her father, my grandfather, because he chased him away, called him white trash, biker abandoned, whatever. And that's exactly what my mother told me. So I was thinking, okay, he had to have at least been there. Right. He could have known these things. So I was thinking, okay, he was at least there and they had orgies and whatnot. It could have been any one number of people. And, um, but I, he had sent a second letter where he was kind of a little more aggressive and he was he was like don't ride on my coattails and you know you're just a wheel and I don't even like wheels anymore and I came before you and you know so I was 
I made me mad. I wrote Did back you, to him. I'm I was like, saying it almost seems like a test. Yeah, you like to I'm test like, I don't people. There's no walk in the park riding on your coattails, you know. I'm like, screw you. So I had get, someone had given me an original photograph of him at Dennis Wilson's house, and um, I mailed it to him. I said, well, look, this photo's probably worth three grand. If I was trying to ride on your coattails, I'd be asking you for photos, not sending you photos. So here's a photo, you know, f off and you know whatever. So then I get this thing from him, which is like. Okay, like a photograph in return, one signed, so it's better, worth probably more money, by a transvestite hooker that was either like obsessed with him or obsessed with me or stalking me or something. Then yeah, thinking, that makes you wonder, you well, know. I was like, thinking, did he like send her it, whatever, out to like let me know, you know, was this a threat? Was the was card it? taken after you had already written to him? After I'd written to okay, him, and after so, I wrote that letter that, you know. So he would have had your address, okay. Oh, yeah. And so I almost felt like this, you know, like like I was a little bit like, like should I be worried or is this, you know. Is he, right. Is he have people yeah, looking out? He does. Keep people, seeing what you're up to? And he, he actually, somebody was talking, you know, was saying some things about me in Texas and he, he's like, yeah, somebody was talking shit about you in Texas and here's their address. You know? Really? So, so he I, sounds like somebody that likes to stir up trouble, you well, know, obviously. I don't know if he likes to stir up trouble, but he's got people that would be happy to stir up trouble, you know, for him. I right, guess. absolutely. And so I was a little bit, you know, concerned. I, I, you know, kind of freaked me out a little bit. So I didn't know what to think, honestly. I still don't know what to think. Yeah. And um, so, you know, at that point, I was pretty convinced. So, and, and, and then it was a minute before we corresponded again because of that, you know, we, we kind of didn't... How many years did you correspond with him, would you say? It went on, it went on to the very end, when, even when I went to visit him in the hospital. Um, I had, you were able to go visit him in the hospital? No, I wasn't. I, I went to um, Bakersfield, and I went to Mercy Hospital, and I was, they kicked me out of the parking lot even. Really? Yeah, but what was cool is they, I, I was able to um, talk to a... Um, one of the supervising um, uh, guards, you know, the, the the correctional officers, the lieutenant, right, who was standing right next to Charlie at the time, and he spoke, to, you know, I spoke to him, and he spoke to Charlie, and we spoke like that. Okay. And he, and he assured me it was all right. He wasn't dying. He, you know, he had this problem and that problem that he'd be going back to the hospital, and and the guy was very cool actually. That was very cool, cons you know, after how the hospital had treated me, and um, so it made it worth it for me to go up there you know and right so i so we had been corresponding all the way from 2001 was my first letter and and when i wrote him he wrote me back in like two weeks like he was expecting me almost and um were you ever concerned that it wasn't really him because there were stories of like him letting people in prison write his respond to mail and things for him well it's funny you say that because that's the very reason i never went and visited him because he himself said that people are intercepting your letters and um, that these are bad people that are going to be getting out of jail some of them you don't even want them knowing who you are and he said I don't think you should come and visit you know and I I kind of thought about it I was like okay this is Charles Manson telling me these are bad people right and he said one of them is some guy famous guy who they found genitals in jars in his basement or something you know and and they did that was like the worst of the worst of the worst in that shoe or whatever they call it. So I took his advice and, and I didn't go visit him. I didn't want to... Uh, do you regret it now? Like, do, do. You, you wish you would have? I do. I wish I would have. I do. And... Um, do you think he believed that you were his son? Do you, yeah. What, you do? Yeah. Because do, does he say that in any of the letters? Or yeah, how does well, he respond have, yeah, to that? I have letters where he... Um, he... Um, and he spoke to other people too like he was very fond of my mother he was the only woman the only girl he actually was in love with and they had a very close relationship and the other girls got jealous and um, how long was she around the, the family or not how long what happened is he had taken and this is how Bugliosi came to um, believe me to be legitimate and, and because I had, my mother told me how they had taken a bus trip and they went across the country and they um that's when they went back to wisconsin my mother was from excellent wisconsin and Teresa bruner was from eau claire wisconsin and they were little towns that had the same post office they shared post office right next to each other so um that was charlie's first girl and they went back to meet her friend my mother because they wanted to recruit girls and my mother was a young cute hippie looking girl and 
and fit the profile, so they drove to California on the bus. She went out with them and, and um, to Berkeley or whatever it was. And they hit it off really well, and, and like I said, he was really fond of her, and, and in his letters he said, um, you know, that I, you know, you're, I met your mother, and your, your mother's father chased me off from my white bed and outlaw trash or whatever. He goes, you know, not that, it, it, not knowing your father has his goods and bads. I didn't know my father, and I learned from all men. Blah, 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 blah. He said, yes, I was in Cook County. Um, yes, I knew, I knew your mother, and um, I didn't want to shatter your brain patterns, he said. And he sent her back on a bus. Um, what did he mean by that? Shatter your brain patterns? I don't know. And he said, and, and he said it was an, what an experience to last a lifetime, he said. He sent her back on a super cheap bus, train or whatever. And um, so she came back, and sorry, I got this thing in my teeth. Um, and he sent her back because the girls were threatening her. They were unsafe. They, they, they were jealous. And it wasn't all hippie, free love, like, you know, some think. And, right. And so she did not... She a lot not of a, people competitive for Charlie's love kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. And um, she was not a part of all that murder and mayhem. And um, she gave birth to me. And he even wrote a song for me. I got letters from him where he, he said, I wrote you the song. And... It was written before I was born, and it's about finding your father somewhere on a sunshine. I mean, it's quite poetic. Did she tell him about. that she was pregnant? Yes, yeah, they, yeah she Okay. Knew, she knew. He knew, she knew. I mean, he couldn't know for certain, I guess. Nobody could, uh, you know, because there was a lot of fucking going on. I right, guess. right. But he, he felt it, and she felt it, and they both believed it. And, um, and Were like you ever, said, ever able to get photos of them together? Have you ever found... No, well, this is the thing. I've only got two photos of my mother, period. And I've been vehemently opposed to the media finding out her name because she suffered so much already. Is she still around? Or yeah, is she, okay. she's in Wisconsin and I think a, a home now. But I've cut off communications with her because she was so mentally ill in, in that she, um, I mean, for one, she was afraid still. And, uh, right. Actually, um, That's got to be traumatic when you're going through a lot of that at the age of 18 and living with all the... I'm, I'm okay. not sure if she was mentally ill from the get-go, if it caused it, or the LSD, or the drugs, but, you know, she um, had worked with the FBI, and, 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 you know, she was worried about her life, and said that they were already investigating him before the murders, and that they were investigating an individual named Ski, that they weren't sure if it was Charlie in disguise or a lookalike. Mm. Like maybe agent provocateur or something. She said that they, Charlie was never talking about a black-white race war thing. She said that they were talking about the Folgers people, and she said she didn't understand what their anger was with the Folgers people. She liked coffee, she said. But the black-white race war thing was simply that Charlie had, this Black Panther had taken some of the girls hostage, lots of Papa was his name. Yeah. And Charlie went and rescued him and shot the guy in the stomach. He thought he killed him. So he thought the Black Panthers were going to come back for their pound of flesh and right. seek revenge. So they kind of were preparing for that. It was no global... It was more of a Bugliosi thing. Like Bugliosi he knew that that's one of the things he could use yeah. to get people on his side, he, really. I think it was he wanted to simplify it because the, the whole extreme left environmentalist versus the extreme right political politically was maybe too much for the common public to, to take. So he broke it, broke it down this simple black-white thing. Right. But um, it's just like the OJ true. case, you know, that was like the defense for that. Yeah. So and apparently tried and true working. He took a page out of that book and, 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 you know, Charlie was denied due process. The president said you're guilty and wasn't allowed to testify before the jury. They were afraid he was going to brainwash the jury and believe what he said was true. I mean, it was so ridiculous. Um, the, the hysteria, even Bugliosi in his book said that Charlie, at one point Charlie looked at the clock and made the time stop. So I always wanted to ask Bugliosi, do you really believe that he looked at the clock and made the time stop? Or is that just more for the legend that they could... Because if you do, you kind of got to question Bugliosi's mental state at that time. If he didn't and he made it up and lied, you got to wonder what else he might have lied. Right. And, um, and I think, you know, like, Can... like Charlie used to say, all my life I've been a two-bit no-good criminal, criminal, and now I'm some mastermind with mind control powers. And, and um, 
you know, you got to think Bugliosi saw his meal ticket there. He saw his million dollar, you know, Right, and that's story. not a case that people were going to let go unsolved or un and, and unpunished Charlie anyway. Charlie the perfect boogeyman, and, and he, he, it's interesting because he, um, he kind of believed that the um, ends justified the means. So Charlie being denied due process, so what? You got a bad guy off the street, and, you know, whatever. But Bugliosi, in the end of his life, kind of went full circle when he went up against the Supreme Court justices and he wrote a book about how they threw the election. And he had them all pictured on the cover in mug shots. Right? Well, I'm sure the Supreme Court justices believe the ends justify the means too when they didn't want a liberal president, you know? And he got blacklisted by the media after that. It was on the flip side of that coin, so he got to kind of see what that side was like. Right. Kind of cool in a way, you know? Now, did, did Charlie ever mention anything when Bugliosi passed away? Nothing? Not now, to me. Now, when Charlie passed away, what happened in your life? Did, did, did you, you know, because. A lot of people were claiming or coming out saying that they were the person that should get his remains right. and his possessions. What happened there? Well, what happened there is interesting because normally an adopted child has no claim to the uh, biological parents' finances or inheritance or, or you know, Right, state. blood, blood and, or not. And, and it doesn't even matter if you're blood related, it's who's legally. So Jason Freeman, the legal grandson, would have legally been the one who had the right to the estate and to the... Um, claim the body. Now, all of a sudden, I get a call from this person uh, in, in Chicago named Ben Gorecki, who was a uh, memorabilia guy for Charlie, and a ch close friend of Charlie's. And he produced a will that he said Charlie sent to him that named me as the sole beneficiary. Was it notarized estate. and everything? Um, it was, it was, uh, there was one witness on it. Okay. Now you have to imagine when there's only six people in in his section of prison, it would be pretty hard to get three witnesses like the state requires, right? Or get it notarized. So, um, no, it, it wasn't. But um, but there was witnesses or a witness, and so that was all going to be kind of a problem. Um, and um, and also they the state was going to cremate the body, and um, I felt like. You know, he deserved a memorial like anybody, regardless of what he did or whatever. There's the people that care for him still have the right to, to grieve or to, you know, to, right. To, I mean, these flies are driving me nuts. Yeah. Um, and and so my whole concern with that, I didn't care about the estate or any of it, um, although it was said to be valued at somewhere between one and three million dollars. I'm not quite sure how or what. But right. Would that have included his song? His, writing, his songs, copyright and everything? But I had a lawyer friend of mine look into that, and, and at that time, you could only go back three years. Okay. And it was the, the time in history where the publishers made the least amount of money publishing music ever. So even though he wrote songs for the Beach Boys that sold millions of copies, the last three years they didn't sell so many copies. So it really wouldn't have been worth that much money. Right. Although it could get in other movies later on. But but I didn't care. I didn't want the money. I wanted the... The, the memorial. I didn't want him to be cremated. So, so you came out and said something. Well, or? I came out and presented the will that was given to me because now I have a horse in the race. Before I didn't have a leg to stand on, and um, but what I ended up doing was making a deal with Michael Bruner and his lawyer because I didn't have a lawyer. I didn't have one. Mine. Wouldn't Who's money. Michael Bruner for people that don't know? Michael Bruner was one of the first children that came out in the '80s, and um, he was Mary Bruner's son. Yet he's never had a DNA test either, and he looks an awful lot like one of the other guys she was hanging out with, so I don't know if he's biologically related or not, neither does he, but he's the most well-known for being... Now, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Why didn't anybody just do DNA tests against Charlie Manson's DNA? Well, let me tell you, um, that's what I was fighting for the body for. Now, you can't will somebody a body. The, so the body goes to the next of kin and and so I didn't win Jason won he got the body and they promised me his lawyer and Jason promised me they would give me DNA tests exactly. were there samples I was going to say were there samples yeah and okay. I talked to the and this is the sad part and I talked to the lawyer of the coroner for a long time in the cafeteria of the court and he told me that they took blood samples and he said that I will give you blood samples to test the DNA. He said, I don't feel, I feel like you have the right to know or whatever. And I said, great. He said, so call 
our office and I'll set it up and we'll, we'll handle it. Now this was a Friday, it was Thursday or Friday, or I think it was a Friday. And I said to him, I said, okay, now what, I mean, should I call like, right when I get home or should I call, wait, he said, wait the weekend if you want it, don't hurry, we got it, it's not going anywhere. And, um, you know, so I did, I waited the weekend and during that time, Jason won and got control of the body and said, no, you can't have blood, you can't have DNA. And, and said the and, and the lawyer stopped the coroner and the coroner's lawyer for doing anything either. So you were never able to get a DNA test. Nope. And now Jason has since been ordered by the courts to have DNA test and he failed. Really? Yeah. And he's who they ultimately gave Charlie's remains to. Yep. Which are now in a museum in Las Vegas. Something they sold parts and the ashes went in people's mouths. It's just. Yeah, they've made. I've seen that they've made artwork out of yeah. his ashes and then, like I said, I. I was in, uh, it's called the uh, Haunted Museum in, uh, in Las Vegas, and he claims to have been given the ashes. Yeah, and you know... Have you dropped it? I mean, are you still going... Well, what, how, where's this? Because you told me you're making a movie now. A documentary, yeah. I got booted out. This, what happened, it, it, blows the, it boggles the mind how corrupt everything can be. Because first of all, I watched uh, Jason's lawyer, his name is Kicken, Offer the court, the clerk, the court clerk, to pay her medical bills or whatever. Now, I, that that's not bribery. I don't know what is. Or, you know, I, you gotta wonder what else he offered to whom. But anyway, I teamed up with Michael Bruner and his lawyer, and he was supposed to represent me also, but he didn't. He only was concerned about his client. As soon as his client got got. Recluse. As soon as someone won, basically. as soon as he wasn't going to win, because he 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 advertised, I've never lost a case, so he gets forty grand a case. He didn't want to not be able to advertise, I never lose a case, so he dropped me. And then when I went to court, the judge said he'd given me three chances to file something or whatever. I didn't know anything about it, and I, the, <laughs> Michael Bruner's lawyer actually at one point said there were, you know. 15 errors in the way that I filled out the paperwork or whatever now that would lead you to believe that he Himself did it correctly, right? Well, he didn't he didn't do anything. He had no intentions of doing anything I, He was I was to serve a purpose to help his client win beyond that I can kick rocks as far as he's concerned and I got he dumped me and when I went to court the judge said you've had all the time in the world to do this that and the other Bye, you're gone now. Let me ask you now that that's happened and knowing how emphatic a lot of the kind of Manson community is, have you had backlash? Do you have people harassing you or anything like that? Or no, has everything of, been fine? I have or? a lot of support. They, really? Oh yeah. They, they're, what's funny is if you look at the comment boards and the blogs or whatever, people comment in the negative. They, they go out of the way to comment in the negative. They never go out of the way to comment in the positive. So if you're, you know, 50-50 negative to positive, you're really about 90-10. Right, so, right, and, right. And when I did the CNN thing, they actually took down the uh, negative comments about CNN and took them off the comment board. Whitewashed and it, yeah. eventually shut the comment board down because they were looking so bad because I, it was overwhelmingly, people were like, what are you talking about? It proves that he's Charlie Manson, not Charlie Manson's son. It doesn't prove anything. It proves that I'm not related to Jason, you know? And they're like, how can you be such He's so bad, you know. So that's that's really. how they compared it. They basically took Jason's DNA and compared it to yours, not yours and, to Charlie's. Right, right, said that I'm not related to Charlie because I didn't match Jason. And it turns out Jason didn't match. And I knew this at the time because Jason's father, well, the, who he thought, he claimed was his father, Charles uh, White or whatever, Charlie's son, was, you know, impotent. And when he found out his wife was pregnant, he knew he was cheating on her and he left her. And didn't acknowledge Jason as his son, and 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 left. So, um, you know, Jason was just opportunistically trying to get you know money or whatever, and did succeeded. And um, it's just incredible. It's a travesty of justice. I mean, you know, I did a DNA test with um, Rebecca, my half sister. That was a match. You know, and the only common denominator we had was Charlie. Our mothers were hanging out with Charlie, and. When I did a test with his DNA, we smuggled it out of prison, which is a federal offense, by the way, it's a felony. You know, it's, 
not easy to do. We got a wristband. And the, the people at the lab, I talked to them, they, they said there are five of us pining over the results, and we want to say positive, but we can't. There's another person's DNA, it's contaminated. I said, well, only one other person touched the wristband. They said, well, send us that DNA, we'll figure it out. So I did, and then they said, well, we don't have enough original DNA material left to do another test. So that's as far as it went. And, and um, So what are you trying to do now? What is your... Well, you know, facial recognition now has a 94% accuracy rate in determining who your parents are by photographs. So um, I had a gentleman contact me from Salt Lake City who actually has gone to court and overturned paternity and maternity tests and different criminal things or whatever and used his uh, facial recognition technology um, and the courts recognize it and, and it's recognized as being 94% uh, accurate. So he didn't, he didn't want to go public, he wanted to remain anonymous and um, so I have to respect that or whatever. But anybody can go pay 20 bucks or whatever it is and compare the photos and see for themselves whether I'm related or not. And then is I, that all you want just to, do you want to be accepted or do you just I, want to know? I know, I don't need, you know, I don't care, I know what I know. I don't. You know, everybody else seems to be hung up on this DNA. I don't even, you know, when they tested my sister, they tested what were called alleles. When they tested me and Jason, they tested chromosomes. And, and um, you know, my girlfriend had a friend who was gay who had female chromosomes. And, you know, then they, the mitochondrial DNA, everyone's like, well, just take a hair or whatever. You to do hair, you have to have 10 hairs. They all have to have follicles. They're going to be two weeks old. And, right. and, you know, it's not as easy as people think. And, and then they said Charlie was Chimera, which is a rare DNA where you have two codes, which was one thought to only be 48, million, uh, 48 cases ever until 23andMe came out and said that there's millions of people who are Chimera. And then they're saying there's 40% of these tests are inaccurate. And I don't know. I don't think, I don't know what to think. You know, so. Dude, I, you know what? I, I don't know what to think either, but I do know it's like kind of undeniable who you look like. What I mean, the how can it not? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. And, and the way I feel about it is, if it's not, then I've got a problem on my hands. You know, like <laughs> yeah. it would be more. You have no shocking. clue who your parent. Well, and then how did I get sucked into all this? And how could all of these things? You know, so right. It's, it's really not. I'm not but dude, dude, thank you for sharing your story. Now, you're gonna be in tomorrow's vlog that we're gonna film now because one of the reasons Vicky hooked us up is because you are phenomenal at something that, well, I'll save the surprise for tomorrow, but thank you for being on the vlog sure. and everyone can see one of your other kind of bizarre talents tomorrow. Oh, right. <laughs> right, right. Thank you, Matthew. Okay.